Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, before we get into back into our uh, Sunday evening service series of stewarding uh, life, and tonight we're going to be looking at the issue of stewarding trials. I think we may be a little loud here, Bruce. At least it seems a little loud to me. Um, I just want to encourage you with continuing in the scriptural truths that we were challenged with in our past revival. Uh, This past week in our um, family devotions, we've been going through uh, Brother Will Rice's uh, book, First Light, The Morning Devotions, and we haven't always had them at the same meal or at the same time of the day, but we've been fairly consistent throughout the week. And one of the topics of discussion Um, was about the revival that came to Nineveh. And and now this wasn't directly in in correlation to the devotional thought of the day, but um, the thought was, you know, here God um, really did a wonderful work in the city of Nineveh, and the people repented, and he really did send a wonderful spirit of revival. But it only lasts, I believe it was 120 years, and then God ended, send it, God ended up sending judgment. And so here we are, a week removed from our last revival service. And I want to encourage you to continue to focus on the presence of God. Uh, beholding Him face to face. Continuing to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Continuing to walk in the Spirit, be filled by the Spirit, continuing in those decisions. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and if you'd follow along as I read verses 1 through 10. Here the Bible says, Apostle Paul speaking, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Then Paul says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seemeth, he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And then Paul says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there is given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You know, when we think about trials, we don't often think about those being gifts of God for us to steward, but rather we look at them as things to avoid, right? Right? I'm going to avoid that as much as I can. But tonight, uh, and tonight's the first part of a two-part message on stewardship of trials. Uh, Tonight, we're going to begin looking at the Apostle Paul and Job and see that as the trials that came into their lives, how they accepted the trials as a gift of God, and they relied upon his strength to go through them. Uh, Some of you noticed that I have some gifts up here on the table, and there's actually six gifts. Now, whether it's uh, this this one right here um, is a Christmas gift, it's it's actually wrapped in Christmas wrapping paper. That doesn't mean that it's a Christmas gift, but we'll just say it's a Christmas gift. Uh, This one we'll say is a birthday gift, And this one's pink, so we'll say it's an anniversary gift, husbands for your wife, okay? So we've got three gifts on the top and three gifts on the bottom. And um, there's different types of personalities when it comes to gifts. 
Some want to be totally surprised. They don't want any hints. That's my wife and my daughter. They don't want, uh, you know, to hint. They don't want to take the gift and to shake it, rattle it, peel the paper back, and see if they can figure out what's, what the box is anyways. They like total surprises. Then there's the rest of us. If there's a gift in sight and our name's on it, we pick it up, we shake it, we squeeze it, you know, we smell it <laughs> to see if, hey, maybe it's candy. Uh, maybe it's food. And again, uh, Robin totally... Totally got me at Christmas when I thought I had like a big old thing of some type of food and it was a, it was a weight ball to exercise with for Christmas. How disappointing was that? But, but we, we look at these gifts and we think, you know what, that's something that I would enjoy. Matter of fact, um, I spent time this afternoon, valuable, precious time, wrapping all these gifts. Now this gift kind of looks, you know, it kind of looks fairly nice. Um, this gift, not so nice, right? Um, it's in black construction paper. So instead of actually opening the gifts, um, I have the gift underneath on a sticky note. And so this gift right here is the gift of financial security. And whatever that means to you, that's what this gift is. Now, if you were to receive this gift tonight of financial security... That would be a nice gift, right? It, it would be a gift that you would say, that is not only a nice gift, but I want to take care of it. God, I thank you for it. And I thank you for the security that you've given me financially. Now, ultimately, my security is in you, but thank you for blessing me to where I don't have to worry about finances, how the next bill is going to be paid, or if I'm going to have enough money to put food on the table for my family, um, if I'm going to be able to buy gifts for my spouse or my children for their special day that's coming up. So financial security is a gift that I'd say we'd all say, that's one I wouldn't mind receiving. Matter of fact, um, I would even ask the Lord to give me wisdom in stewarding it. This gift right here is an absolutely new home. They say, well, I've got a home. And for some of us, that would be like, well, I'll take a new one. I, I mean, even what I have right now, if it's brand new and I could pick the floor pan and I could pick, you know, the, the, the closet space or the bathroom space or the layout of the kitchen or, you know, the man cave, whatever it is, if I could design it, this would be a nice gift that, you know, Lord, if you gave me a new home, then I pray that I'd steward it for you that I'd use it to have other believers over to encourage, that I'd use this new home to have lost people in and try and witness to them and share them the good news. So we would all agree that a new home would be a nice gift to Stuart, right? Um, for me, it would be a, a home that doesn't need any remodeling done in the bathroom. I, I've got some work tomorrow morning to do. Uh, in to finish up our master bath, and then it's on to Kylie's bathroom. And it's starting over from scratch, the whole process. But a new home would be a nice gift to Stuart. This gift right here is the gift of a restored relationship. And as much as financial security would be, as much as a new home would be, you know, there are many of us here tonight who have a relationship that we would just absolutely, it would be one of the greatest gifts that God could ever give, would be for that relationship that there is something between, there's, there's a rift, there's, there's an obstacle, um, there's a, a canyon of a divide for that relationship to be restored. And we would say that, that would be a gift to be stewards. So the first three gifts we've, we've looked at, you know, these would be gifts that we would gladly receive and that we would gladly steward for God's honor and glory. But there's three gifts behind them. This black gift right here 
is the gift of major car or home repair. Oh, that's like the transmission just went out. Or the septic tank just backed up. Or the water line just broke. Or the electrical system in a house needs to be rewired. And we go on and on and on. But this also is a gift. Now, this is a gift that we would say, God, I'll avoid. I could do without. I, I don't want to steward the gift of major home or car repair. This second black gift is the gift of unemployment. Now, some in our church, they, they have retired, and so they're not at work anymore. But uh, imagine if you're retired now and you are still working, and all of a sudden you got your two-week notice or you didn't even get a two-week notice. And all of a sudden you're no longer employed. There's no severance package. There's no, there's no benefits or, or buyout or anything Regardless of how many years you put in, you are now unemployed, without work, without income. A gift that we would say, I'll put that one back. <laughs> you know, give me the financial security. <laughs> I don't want unemployment. But nonetheless, it's a gift. And then this last gift is the gift of cancer. And it seems that it's almost becoming more of not if, but when someone in your family or you as individual will be diagnosed with cancer. Uh, regardless of your political persuasion, just this past week, uh, a very um, uh, familiar and influential uh, conservative talk show host died. Of cancer. And there are people within our own congregation who have died of cancer. Probably most of us have a family member that's been diagnosed with cancer. And you'd say, you know, um, if I have to get a test, I have to get a biopsy on something, I, I, this is a gift. No, thank you. But you see, while the gift of relationship, financial security, new home would be ones that we would gladly receive and steward. God, in that gift of a trial and a major car or home repair, there's something underneath it. Because there's more than just the major car repair and home repair that God wants to do in your life and my life. It's the peace of God that he wants to bring in your heart. And as we as believers effectively steward the major repair in the car or the home, we can steward that, we can go through it with God's peace. When it comes to the gift of unemployment, and while we would never choose or wish to go through this gift, God has something in store, and that is for us to see God's hand of provision in that trial. As Philippians chapter 4 says, But my God shall supply all your needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. As the psalmist said, I, am, I have been young and old, and I have not yet foreseen the righteous forsaken. God will provide. And it may be that God is wanting you to see his provision in your life as opposed to you providing. And then cancer or some chronic illness or whatever the, the health need may be, God is desiring for you to know his presence. As Isaiah chapter 53 talks about the one who created us, the one who redeemed us, the one who we are precious in his sight. When you pass through the waters, they will not overflow you. 
when you walk through the fire, you will not be consumed. Why? Because he is with us. You know, we'd all accept the good gifts, but it's the gifts of trials that we struggle with. We see the good gifts as profitable, the trials as undesirable. And God, you can have those back, but yet it's those trials as we steward them. Sometimes the most heavy gifts, the heaviest trials, when we steward them properly, accepting God's grace and his strength to go through them, all of a sudden we find the greatest blessing. Remember Evangelist Miller's first message? about a passion for God's presence. That first point, the priority of God's presence. You know, God, Moses speaking, we could have the promised land, the land of covenant promise. We could have all the protection and the blessings and the peace of all that, but if it's not for your presence, we don't want to go. And so may God help us to see the importance and the value of, of accepting trials as a gift for God to steward them for his honor and glory. Paul Chapel shares the illustration of Charlie Brown and Linus are having a conversation with each other. And Linus says this, I don't like to face problems head on. I think the best problem, the best way to solve problems is to avoid them. As a matter of fact, uh, this is a distinct philosophy of mine. No problem is so big or so complicated that I can't run away from it. And may God help us not to run away from the problems, but to accept them as a gift. You think about Job in Job chapter 1. We're introduced to him in Job chapter 1. He's the wealthiest man, probably one of the wealthiest men alive at that time. Having everything that a man could desire, a healthy family, wealth, respect, influence. Uh, he was a leader. And yet, in just a matter of hours, he lost it all. He even lost the support of his wife. And, and just, uh, just uh, uh, for whatever it's worth. Uh, a husband can go a long ways on the support and encouragement from his wife. And the criticism, like Job's wife, the criticism of wife can destroy a man's hope and dreams quicker than nothing else. Listen to Job's wife's support. She says, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Her advice to him was, Curse God and die. And yet as Job thought about all the trials that just came down one after the other, he made a choice, and that choice was to steward the trial, accepting the good hand of God and accepting what God had allowed to come down in his life. As it says in Job chapter 2, verse 10, when Job responds to his wife's, advice to curse God and die, Job says, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And, and believe me, throughout the book of Job, there's times when Job cried out to God, why? Why are these things happening to me. Job 30, 26, when I looked for good, then evil came unto me. And when I waited for light, there came darkness, but yet he chose to wait patiently for God to lead him through. In your life, what message have you recently received? What bad news, what trial has come down your pike? What criticism are you facing, maybe in the home, in the workplace, amongst that you care about, those that you care about the most? Those trials are difficult. 
Paul Chappell says this, stewarding trials is a unique aspect of stewardship. It raises a seeming contradiction. How do you steward something in which you have no control in the first place? And it seems that no one would choose to steward trials as they invade our lives without invitation. Then he goes on to say, when we speak of stewarding trials, we do not mean that we want to control the trial. It's not like stewarding finances or stewarding scheduling time. Rather, it is a choice to reveal the trials of life, to receive the trials of life with acceptance and yieldedness so that God is free to work in our lives and bring good from the trials. So instead of choosing to know, thank you. I don't want that. I'll take this, but I'm not going to take that. Right? By the way, they're empty boxes, so <laughs> there's nothing breakable. It's not Robin's fragile china or anything in there. I, I don't want those. Instead of rejecting the trials, we receive the trial from God's hand and we trust him to go through it with us. We're going to look at the first of three wonderful uh, results of believers stewarding trials tonight in our message. The first wonderful area which God desires to work in our hearts in the area of stewarding trials is in the area of humility. As you came in tonight, um, there was a handout on the back table. If you didn't get that and you want to slip out to the back and pick that up, you can do that at this time, or if you just want to <coughs> just jot notes, uh, we'll review next week in our, our um, uh, review and preparation to continue this series. But the first area is in the area of humility. Um, all of us have the propensity for pride, right? We want what we want. We want it in our time. We want it in our way. Wasn't that Lucifer's downfall? Isaiah 14, I will. The seven I will statements. And while we see it in Lucifer's fall from heaven, it's evident in our lives as well. And there's many times that God will allow us to steward a trial to help deal with the pride in our hearts. Because instead of the pride, what God is desiring to produce is humility. What do we desire? We want recognition. We want to become greater and greater. And yet, the Apostle John said in the Gospel of John, he must increase and I must decrease. If there was a, a Christian in the, in the first century that could have boasted, it certainly was the Apostle Paul. Now, in the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when we opened up, we read some verses about this man that he knew that was caught up into heaven and had this vision and saw things that were too wonderful for him to even utter. Uh, most Bible scholars believe that that was the Apostle Paul himself. So think about in our day, in our society, and even our Christianity, you know, um, having someone, and we've even had some people who have talked about how they believe they had a death experience and went to heaven and now are back on earth. And they've talked about that, right? And, and I believe that there's several people that have books written They've done several different things. So this is not certainly in jest or in ridicule or mocking of that. But the Apostle Paul did not come back and write a book about his near heaven experience. As a matter of fact, it happened 14 years earlier than what he's writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And as he's writing this, he's writing it in third person. It's because he had learned some things about humility instead of pride. And so being in heaven and, and seeing things that are, that are just absolutely wonderful 
You got instead of writing writing a book, instead of you know getting on all the TV shows and uh, doing interviews and scheduling a tour to talk about his heaven experience, the Apostle Paul yet learned humility. As a Pharisee, before he was saved, he had much reason to boast as well. As far as knowing the law, keeping the law as best as a Pharisee could, although we knew that Paul had sinned and had fallen short. And yet, he had learned the importance of humility. Paul could have profited by gaining respect and recognition. He could have profited financially from his heaven vision and experience, and yet he chose to take the path of humility. Uh, As we take a look at this portion of uh, one of the blessings of stewarding trials, when it comes to humility, first of all, we see the presence of the trial, the presence of the trial. In the passage, we talked about, uh, Paul talked about the thorn of, of, of the flesh that he was given, lest he should be exalted above measure. And many folks have speculated what this, this, uh, this thorn was. Some have talked about it being the many trials and persecutions that the Apostle Paul had gone through. Uh, many others believe that it was a physical problem such as his eyesight that uh, the Apostle Paul had. Uh, whatever the, the thorn was, whatever the trial that God had given him to steward, the reality of the pain, the reality of the, the problem of the trial was so great that the Apostle Paul really believed in his heart that, God, if you remove this thorn, then I would be a more effective minister for you. You know, God, if, if I'd stopped getting shipwrecked, bitten by snakes, stoned, beaten, thrown in jail... Uh, whipped all these things. You know, God, if I could just do without this a little bit, then I could maybe write another gospel for you. Or I could go to another unreached city that has never heard the gospel, and I could preach the glorious gospel, and we could start a church in that city. But you see, although Paul was so persuaded that, God, if you remove the trial, if you remove the thorn. I could be that much more effective for you. And yet, although it was a reality and it was a painful burden to him, God had a different plan for him. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, Paul says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. So there was a presence of a trial in his life. It was real. Do you have a thorn in your life right now? Something, and and if it was a physical thorn, I think one of the worst places to get like a cactus needle is in your foot, especially on the bottom of your foot, or to get a thorn there, because you can't take any steps at all without knowing that it's there, right? It's a constant reminder, so what do you want to do? You want to get it out. And I think nothing worse is is putting on what you think is a clean pair of socks and, and there was some cactus needles or something somehow that got through your shoe and they're in, went through the laundry and now it's in your sock and you put it on and you're like, ouch. And so you take the sock off, you're looking for it, can't find it, put the sock back on as soon as you take another step, ouch. And finally, you end up just throwing the sock away, right? You're not going to deal with it anymore. You want to remove it. So the presence of the trial, how do we deal with that thorn that's constantly pricking us? Do we ignore it? Do we try to overcome it? Or do we rely upon the Lord's strength? Secondly, not only the presence of the trial, but capital B in your outline, the purpose of the trial. The purpose of the trial. Think about the Apostle Paul's life as a missionary. As a church planter, he was preaching all over the known world, Macedonia, Europe at that time, planting churches, discipling new converts, um, training people like Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, Luke, and, and leaving them like he left Timothy to pastor the church of Ephesus. 
He wrote at least 13 books of the New Testament, giving instructions to local churches. As it says in 2 Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And, and so the Apostle Paul, when it came to his life, when it came to his ministry, he was very effective. But did his life match his message? Well, we can see that uh, in the book of Acts, kind of is a biography of Paul's life. But in 2 Corinthians, we kind of have um, chapter 11, we kind of have an abbreviated um, update of the persecutions that the Apostle Paul went through. Here he says, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28, Of the Jews received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. And journeys often, and perils of waters, and perils of robbers, and perils of mine own countrymen, and perils of the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, and weariness, and painfulness, and watchings often, and hungering, and thirst, and fasting often, and cold, and nakedness, beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches." And you see that the Apostle Paul went through all of these sufferings. But yet, as 2 Corinthians closes out, he's persistent. He has hope in God. But yet, the effectiveness of the Apostle Paul's ministry was not in the gospel which he wrote. It was not in the churches that he planted and the people that he mentored for the ministry. It wasn't even in all the sufferings that he went through. But it was in the thorn of the flesh, the trial that God gave him that enabled him to be effective. So the purpose of the trial, as we see back in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Again, dealing with that importance of humility in our life, in the Apostle Paul's life. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in mine infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The purpose of the trial was for the Apostle Paul to learn humility. For him to learn that his strength was made perfect, that God's strength was made perfect in his weakness. So he's seen the presence, it was a reality in his life. The purpose of the trial was to develop humility in his life. But how about the pathway of the trial? You know, a trial, when we understand and we fully believe that God this is something that you have brought into my life. And although I may not have chosen it, you brought it. And so, God, you know what's best. That's one thing. But when you think about the pathway of Paul's trial, the pathway of Job's trial was Satan. Satan was the one who brought the trial in Job's life. Satan was the one who brought the trial in Paul's life. And many times the trials that come our way come because Satan is buffeting us. The word buffet has the idea of to strike with the fist, with force in the face. It's the same idea of how they mocked and they buffeted Christ as he was being prepared for the crucifixion. That's a little unsettling to think that, God, this trial is not from your hand, but this is from Satan's hand. And right now, this trial I'm going through is none other than Satan buffeting me. Yet in Job's life and Paul's life, yes, Satan was buffeting, but even Satan's buffeting was limited. Because the sovereign hand of God 
was still in control. The first set of trials for Job, you can do anything but touch Job himself. The second part for Job, you can do anything to Job, but you can't take his life. And so although the trials were coming from Satan, God was still sovereign. And there was still a limit. And for you and I as believers, yes, that pathway of that trial may be actually our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion buffeting me. Buffeting us as believers, we can have faith and we can have confidence that God is still in control, that God is still sovereign, and that although Satan may bring blows and trials in our lives, God is still protecting us. Satan can go no further than God allows. Paul Chapel said this quote, Satan is leashed by God's sovereignty. God has his protective hand around our lives. Thus, everything that comes our way, although it may not be sent by God, is filtered through our loving Father. When it comes to trials and accepting them and stewarding them, yes, there is a reality of trials in our lives. The purpose, as we've seen specifically from 2 Corinthians, is that God, as he desired to produce in Paul's life humility, God is desiring to produce humility in our lives as well. And although the pathway of the trial may come as an avenue of Satan, we can realize and have confidence that God is still in control, that he is still sovereign And that he will always provide for us in our time of need. With a human being, the promise of Romans 8.28 would be ludicrous. But with God backing the promise, we can know that all things will work together for good. To them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Even the trial. Even the buffeting of Satan. That thorn in the flesh, shall we not receive good from the hand of the Lord and bad? As Job closed his testimony, he said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Tonight we've seen the first key ingredient or truth that God is desiring to produce in our lives. And that is humility. Will we respond, not resisting, but trusting God and accepting his grace, believing as the Apostle Paul that when I am weak, then I am strong. For the power of God resteth upon me. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. Let's bow for prayer. God, we do thank you so much again for the precious word of God. And in our lives, we do want to be wise stewards of all that you've entrusted into our care. And Father, even as we've opened tonight a little, uh, the thought of stewarding trials, God, help us to respond in humility. Forgive us for times where we have responded in self-reliance and confidence And have done our own thing in our own way. And Father, help us to absolutely, completely rely upon you. Casting all our care upon you, knowing that you care for us. And God, we're so thankful that your grace is sufficient for our time of need. Help us, Father, to steward trials with humility. For your honor and your glory. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a good night.